Hello. <clears throat> In this lecture, we're going to examine Mesopotamian art and culture, beginning with the Sumerians, moving through the Akkadians and Assyrians, and then finally a look at the Persians, which created the Persian Empire. Now, this time period is associated between the dates of 3500 BCE and about 330 BCE with the rise of Alexander the Great and his conquering of the Persian Empire. We're going to look at how the development of a codified system of language, written language, allowed the Persians to develop their culture in a way that prehistoric peoples had not been able to uh, accomplish and how throughout this time period, art and culture flourished because of the stability allowed by this uh, codified system of written language. The Mesopotamian language, known as cuneiform, was a language that com composed of uh, symbols, of shapes, lines, dots, dashes, that when put in combination with each other um, expressed uh, a wide variety of different concepts and meanings. It was a language similar to uh, our language, a letter-based language, but actually cuneiform was a, a precursor to the modern Arabic language, um, as these are the Arabic peoples. Now, it's not the only language that developed during this time period. Um, at the same time that the Sumerians were developing cuneiform, we see the development of pictographic languages like hieroglyphic in Egypt and the development of uh, other symbolic style languages in places in the Aegean and um, where the precursor to the Greeks and, and other places around the Mediterranean. Now, <clears throat> language <clears throat> had an important impact on society. It allowed for a stability. It allowed for a consistency. It allowed for concepts and stories and laws and literature to be passed down from and shared from generation to generation and place to place and allowed communication to develop in a way <clears throat> over great <clears throat> distances. So um, that was that was unique. It was a way that um, it it because of these changes, because of this written language, people could now share ideas in a way that they hadn't been able to before. It wasn't just language in isolation. All of these cultures also um, could communicate across languages by translating from one language to another. Now, translation can be difficult um, because sometimes the meaning between translations is um, can be misunderstood or misconstrued or not be exactly correct. But that basic fundamental uh, ability to share information <clears throat> was uh, an important development in our social history and our cultural history. Now, when we look at the geography of this region, much is made in, in history classes and Western history classes about the area known as the Fertile Crescent, the area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in what is today Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria, um, some places that have recently been um, seen some, some very tragic conflicts and wars. And <clears throat> this, uh, this region has actually seen war uh, off and on for thousands of years. Now, part of the reason why civilization developed here first and culture developed here to such a high level <clears throat> has to do with the geography. It has to do with the... Um, Ready, readily available resources. 
It has to do with the stability that those resources provide. It has to do with the um, consistency that society was able to count on of cultivated crops rather than finding um, wild natural um, food sources and domesticating animals and storing and preserving food sources over time um, to hedge against and, and to uh, prevent against uh, droughts and famines. Um, <clears throat> all of that allowed the Mesopotamians to develop a culture that was highly sophisticated, that was um, that was wealthy, that was prosperous, that was all the things that you need for true art and culture to develop uh, in a, a very significant way. Now, in, initially, Mesopotamian culture develops farther or closer to the south down here, uh, near the mouth of the where the rivers flow into the Persian Gulf. But then slowly over time, the center of Persian culture moves farther to the north and to the west into uh, the Assyrian region. And ultimately, um, the Persian Empire stretches up farther north towards the Aegean and the Black Sea. And we'll see evidence of Persian culture and Persian influence all throughout the region, throughout the middle, what is today the Middle East, North Africa and Egypt, uh, and into um, the Med Mediterranean um, conflicts with the Greeks, conflicts with the Romans, <clears throat> until ultimately the Persians, um, they, they never completely disappear. They, they expand and contract. And we'll even see them later in the semester when we talk about um, the Persian, the rise of the, uh, the new Persian Empire in the medieval. Now, when we study uh, ancient sites, very often what we see are ruins and foundations of structures that looked significantly different uh, when they were first built. So this is an example of just such a situation. This is the what was at one point the ziggurat base for the White Temple of Uruk. Now, the reconstruction, the digital reconstruction that you see in the bottom right is the best guess by historians, by uh, archaeologists, anthropologists, for what that temple may have looked like. We know that they built it out on this uh, pedestal base, um, elevated. It was a natural rock outcropping um, that they carved to have these uh, angled, sheared sides. Um, they carved into the base the, the staircase that allowed for access up to the pedestal. Um, that pedestal courtyard area would have been used to gather, to make offerings. Um, in their <clears throat> system of worship, um, only certain individuals were allowed to enter the temple. Um, priests, uh, the wealthy, the important nobility, or certain individuals at certain times may be allowed to enter. Um, but for the most part, when uh, a, an individual visited the temple to make an offering, um, they would g enter the courtyard area and make their offering there, and then the offering would be made outside the temple, <clears throat> or perhaps certain offerings might be taken inside the temple. And inside, there would have been a, uh, a sculpture of the deity. There would have been um, priests who were worshiping for the, the individuals outside. Um, but this was not a corporate system of worship where everyone gathered inside the temple to worship the way that we'll see later with later forms of, uh, of religion. Now, um, in terms of construction, it's post and lintel style architecture, uh, vertical posts crossed by horizontal lintels. Um, it's made mostly from sandstone. The white that you see is limestone. It's a, uh, it's a limestone block and limestone tile veneered s surface. They favored the use of limestone because it could be polished white to get the, that bright, intense white color. Um, and 
it's built on that ziggurat base for protection. So uh, to access it, the only way to access it easily would be up those stairs. Um, the, the temple needed to be defended because temple was used not only as an offering place, but also as a treasury. And so this, there would have been, and the, the people would have known that there were uh, other people, their enemies would have known that there were um, you know, wealth inside, jewels and riches and things, and wealth inside the temple. Now, um, we, we know some about these early Sumerians. Um, we know that they had a polytheistic society, that they worshipped many gods, and that they would have worshipped those gods in the temple. This was not a, a temple dedicated to a single god. It could, there were probably many uh, idols inside to different gods inside the temple. Um, we also know that they had a hierarchical system to their gods. So certain gods would have been seen as more powerful than others, but that all those gods were part of the, the system of gods. Now, inside the temple... There would have been not only these idols, but there also would have been places to make offerings. There would have been decorative objects like this one. This is called the work of vase. These, these temple vases were used for decoration. They were also used to make offerings. So the, the decorations and the offerings made inside the temple um, would have been a part of that system. So people would bring um, flowers, they would bring produce, they would bring wheat and grains, they would bring all those things that as offerings to the gods. In, in fact, um, there's evidence that these, in, in, a, in written form, um, that the gods required what is referred to as the first fruits. So at, a, at every offering, uh, or at every uh, um, harvesting or gathering of of crops and produce, uh, a percentage, usually about 10%, was taken to the temple uh, as an offering. Those offerings were either burned, they were sometimes, um, they were uh, just allowed to, like flowers would just be allowed to wither, and then that giving of life, basically, was the symbolic gesture to the gods that all that life comes from them or is inspired and influenced by them. And as such, this was the people giving back. Now, on the exterior of the vase, we see carved in relief uh, examples of people making offerings. We see a, a register system. So the bands that surround are not supposed to be one continuous plane or continuous uh, image. So at the bottom, you see images of grain growing. Above that, you see a, a, a procession, a line of cultivated animals or domesticated animals. Those are sheep. And then above that, you see another register of people gathering the harvest. And then above that, you see in the final register at the top, you see image, an image of the priest who has been brought those that gathered harvest, and he's burning the offerings. And so all of this is a, uh, a pictorial, a symbolic uh, communication of their belief systems. And that's what makes objects like this so important because we get a chance to see not only their decorative style and their, their artistic creations, but also it tells us more about their identity. This is called the standard of Ur. Now, it had two sides. It is a... Uh, a standard, basically it was carried in front of the king, and it had, on each side, it has picked, has registers that show a representation of the status of the people and the king, um, whether we're at war or at peace. So when the, <clears throat> the country was at war, you would see this side. This is the war side of the standard of war. And as it was carried in front of the king, um, it, it was a, a, a reference to what was happening in society, but also to the king's authority and the king's role in society. So basically, the Mesopotamians saw the roles of their kings as twofold. First, in peacetime, the, which we'll get to in a minute, 
Um, the king's role was to lead the people um, to make decisions about um, their about the day to day lives of the people to set, solve disputes, but also to be a, a figurehead, basically um, uh, the the most important uh, that they were they were worshipped. The the kings were now in war. The king's role is to lead actively lead the military. They expected their kings to be the leaders, to be the generals, and so uh, and be warriors. Their kings fought in these conflicts, not just you know stayed stayed at the back and sent others. Now. You see here that there has been a battle, and that, of course, the Persian, the Sumerians have been victorious, and so as such, they have brought their captors or captives to the king, who is going to decide their fate, which of course will be to dispatch them. Um, we see the. Uh, in this image, another way that is valuable for us, we see their their um, their armor. We see their weapons of war, uh, the chariots. We see their their the, the row of soldiers and how they would have fought with sword, um, what they wore in terms of protective clothing and armor, um, how they their chariots were armored. Um, and all of this is supposed to show the power and glory of the king. Now, the king is, a, is the central figure at the top. Of course, he's the largest because in Mesopotamia in culture, in imagery, size matters. The more important you are, the bigger of a figure you will be within the image. So the largest figure in any image is always the most important. Not necessarily always the king, but the most important. And then people of the same importance are all the same size. Now, the construction here is gold and enamel. Um, it's, and this would have been carried on a pike in front of the king, kind of like we carry flags in front of the president today, same kind of concept. Now, this is the peace side. And in the peace side, you'll notice everything is pretty uh, domesticated. There's pretty simple. We're bringing animals to market, bringing animals and crops and things to present to the king at the top. You'll notice, too, that there's a clear hierarchy of the roles in society. So the bottom two registers are the normal people, the average people, the farmers, the, the, um, the people who are doing the, the labor of uh, raising the crops. These are agrarian people. Okay. And then the king and his court at the top, and they're seated and they're drinking and eating and celebrating. And again, the king, top left, the largest figure, I mean, he's, he's as big seated as some of the servants who stand next to him. And you also notice that they're all the little details that really do matter. We see the figure in the top right. And he's playing a musical instrument. We see, we get a, a sense of their uh, their design of furniture with the the chairs they're seated on. Um, we get a sense of their their fashion and clothing, with how they're depicted and what they're wearing. Um, all those little details help us to get a clearer picture that we wouldn't have otherwise without the art uh, of how their society operated and their tastes. Um, and that's that's why we study these these objects because it helps us to get a clearer picture of who they were and how they lived. Now, in terms of the pictorial form, it is referred to as a distorted perspective. So we see the head and face in profile. We see the shoulders at a slight angle, not not fully in profile, not fully square to the frame. Uh, we see the the feet. In profile, we see the hips at that same angle, um, and so whether the figures are standing or seated, that distorted perspective is always the same. We'll see the same distorted perspective, uh, a, a slight variation of it, but basically the same dispec distorted perspective in Egyptian art. 
and in some Aegean art. Um, it's quite common in the ancient world for cultures to have influenced each other. Um, that was, you know, it's still today we see cult, cross-cultural influence, uh, and especially neighbors. They didn't. They weren't always at conflict. They weren't always fighting each other, um, and so there's definitely an influence. Now, each culture has its own identity, but they did definitely borrow ideas from each other. This is called the bull-headed lyre. A lyre was a musical instrument, kind of like a harp. Um, it's uh, There were small lyres that could be held and strummed and played by an individual. And then there were other larger uh, objects that would stand uh, in these wooden bases. Um, and the strings uh, were uh, would come out of the sounding box at the base and attach to an arm armature at the top. Uh, like a larger harp that we might see today. These were strummed and played, not necessarily for music like we would think of it, but more uh, for accompaniment to the telling of tales or stories or epic poems um, that by, by people, uh, by individuals at court. So uh, this was basically their form of entertainment. Um, the bull's head here is gold. Um, the what looks to be the, the beard and the hair is actually uh, woven horsehair. And uh, they may, wore these ceremonial beards and wigs. Um, they also wore makeup. We see that kind of eye makeup that surrounds the eyes. The eyes are wide open. And the bull was a symbol of virility and power. And it was, uh, again, this is in every culture because bulls at this point were beginning to be domesticated, but they were still wild animals. There were still plenty of wild bulls. And the bull was at the top of the food chain. It was a very, very dangerous animal. Um, one man most often could not kill a bull. Um, bulls were hunted and had been, but they need, usually were hunted either with animals or in packs of, of both animals and men. Um, and because of that, they, they revered the bull. Um, the highest form of offering was a bull. So uh, on very, very special days, a bull would be sacrificed to the gods. And the head of that bull would then be presented to the king. And so this is a, a, a kind of a connection to that, an image to that. So this is the king's lyre. This would have been at court. <clears throat> and the panel on the front shows... Uh, depictions of that um, of of the king and his court and of the bull and and of the the bull being an offering. Now, as we move into the Akkadian period, um, we'll see that the culture Persian culture is getting larger and larger. It's getting wealthier and wealthier. We're seeing um, that their structures are getting bigger. Okay, this is uh, the ziggurat at Ur. It, uh, because where at Uruk there was a, a natural rock outcropping formation um, they didn't, that they could use to build up the temple. Um, at Ur, which was a larger city, <clears throat> there was no such rock outcropping. So they built this ziggurat, tiered ziggurat base. <clears throat> now, this is brick. Uh, brick block, uh, carved sandstone block, I should say, construction. Um, it is compacted inside the, the walls of the blocks with earth. So it's basically like making a stone-walled uh, mountain. Uh, now, there were two access points, the, the long sets of staircases and these tiered terraces that allowed for protection. So if you were going to try and attack the temple, which people did, you know, uh, you'd have to come up these stairs and, uh, you know, they could be blocked off and they could be, uh, you know, you could be rained down with arrows. Um, and so it'd be very difficult to attack and take the temple, although it, it, it was eventually taken. Uh, the city of Ur was um, attacked and sacked several times. Sometimes by 
challengers with, from within the Persian culture, and sometimes by outsiders. Uh, Persian culture was attacked by the Egyptians at one point, um, well, quite commonly, actually, by the Egyptians, uh, and that was one of their main rivals early on, and then later by the Aegeans and Greeks. Now, on top of this structure, there would have been a temple, uh, much of the same way there was the, the, the White Temple. Um, that temple has long since been destroyed. And, but it would have had much a, a similar construction style to what you see here. And it probably would have had the limestone on the outside. Now, that they didn't put the limestone on the outside of this temple, or outside of the ziggurat, I mean, but they, they would have put it on the outside of the temple on top. We have very few structures and objects from ancient Mesopotamia. As we get further into, into uh, closer to Persia, we'll see more. But because um, so much of this culture has been, or this region has been fought over for so long, um, the objects that remain are few. This is one such uh, very important object. This is the, the a death mask, most likely <clears throat> a death mask of a Mesopotamian king. But uh, we're not 100% certain of that. But because of its, its uh, quality and because they did not bury most individuals, only very special individuals, uh, a mask like this would have been uncommon. The eyes have been gouged out, most likely because they were precious stones, uh, jewels. And when this mask was found, they pried the jewels out because they were val more valuable. Um, than the mask, at least in their mind. Now, um, the mask is made from uh, bronze. It's, uh, it's it has been cast and then carved to to get the details. Um, it would have been placed over the head of the king after his death uh, to protect the face and head uh, at in in burial. Now, this was the death masks like this were not a common practice except for the, the extreme high nobility. So kings, pharaohs in Egypt would have been buried with these death masks. Um, most people would have been cremated and their ashes spread either by the winds or in the water in the river. Now, um, but certain individuals were buried. Uh, the Egyptians favored mummification, which we'll hear about when we talk, talk about them. But we don't know for sure what practices the Mesopotamians used. Uh, most likely a, uh, a ritual purification of the body, a cleansing of the body, an anointing of the body with certain, uh, certain special oils. Uh, and then the body wrapped in linen and placed in a sarcophagus. That's most likely what would have happened. Now, the, what objects like this, though, do show us is the development of their skills and abilities at rendering uh, the human form. The realism here is much greater than what we've would have seen what we've seen in previous cultures. Uh, what little we've seen um, sculpturally, their ability to uh, to manipulate the materials, to carve, to cast, has developed uh, significantly, um, and part of that has to do with their use of writing, because they could write down the the processes they could write down and record the successes and failures and say you know this is how you do it basically now the other common art form from the period are what are known as stele these are tablets uh, usually stone sometimes metal but usually stone um, and they're they're large um, either freestanding or uh, tiled tablets of stone and they were used to uh, record images in relief. So this is carved in relief, it extends away from the surface. Um, and the, the stories are, the images tell stories, basically. Um, and the stories usually relate to um, either significant events, like battles, or the birth or death of an individual, or the life of an individual, uh, or to connect to um, the, uh, the gods, or a religious message. Now, when we see on, or what we see on these tablets um, would have 
only been part of the story. The imagery would have corresponded in many cases on a stele with a text. So uh, either on one side, there would have been an image on the other side of text, or what we think is the case like with this stele, uh, the, the image would have been at the top, and then there would have been another section of the stone at the bottom that would have had a text that, that related to the, store, the story that's depicted in the image. Now, these stele were special. They, they didn't just write down anything or, or record anything. It had to be a very, very, something very, very important that they wanted to remember. It's objects like this where the cliche of something being written in stone comes from. You know, when we say something's written in stone, we mean it's permanent. We mean it's important to remember, to not forget. And so they wouldn't want to forget their battles. They wouldn't want to forget, especially their victories that they want to celebrate but also their defeats. It wasn't just about victories because they wanted to remember the defeats so they could use those as inspiration for the future, so they could use those defeats as a remembrance to say, we don't want to suffer through this again, so we need to be vigilant, we need to be aware that of the possibilities um, of life and death. And so we see that in the images. Now, they also were careful to um, record in these stele um, the importance of certain individuals, of kings, of warriors, both their own and others, because they, they to them, the while they were of course supporting Mesopotamian glory, they respected their enemies, and that was a big thing because they they didn't want to ever uh, take for granted their victories. This is called the Gudea of Lagash. It's a uh, it's it's an important um, type of figure, a kind of a new type of figure. It's a figure that's supposed to represent um, piety, faith. Uh, Lagash was a, a religious center. Um, it's also interesting because it's a kind of a worship idol. So this is an, an idol that would have been placed inside a temple um, and would have been constantly at worship. Um, these, these temple idols, these temple figures, were, uh, were um, purchased and created at the request of individuals, wealthier individuals. Um, and it would have represented a family or not just that one individual, but the whole of his family. And it would have been placed inside the temple and continuously represent the faith and the prayer for success, for continued blessing for that family. So it was almost like the temp, the idol was worshiping for you and praying for you at all times inside the temple. It's also interesting because the idol here is also at, around its base, around its uh, legs, is covered with text. And that text tells us about the family. It tells us uh, those are prayers. Those are important events. So this would have been added to over time. Um, it's a, a, a unique way of combining a historical document, a historical object, and an artistic object. So uh, we get... We get kind of the benefit of both here. Now, the design of it, you see the hands folded kind of in a, in a uh, sub, uh, supplicant gesture. Uh, the head has been cut off, and that, that actually was a, uh, um, a common way to desecrate a temple. When a rival would enter a temple, they would cut the heads off of the, uh, off the idols. Um, it was by you know a gesture that was supposed to um, you know ruin the idol's effectiveness, but also if you know or when the the people who the family members or the, the friends returned to the other people returned to the temple, they would find the temple desecrated, and that was a a, a gesture by rivals uh, to to show their you know their animosity. Now, as we move farther north towards Nineveh, 
um, and and Assyrian culture, um, we see as the cities developed, we see their desire to protect their cities by building walls and gates around the cities. The cities had walls both around the outside and then these large gatehouses like this one at Nineveh. Um, but they also had walls within the city to divide the city into into districts. Um, in, in fact, most cities in the Mesopotamian world were divided into quarters. And we still use that term. You know, you go to a city and you, uh, especially an older city, and you'll see them, areas within the city described as the Latin Quarter, the French Quarter, the uh, the Greek Quarter. Okay, um, and so that that is actually a reflection of not only the size and scale of their cities, but also of the cosmopolitan nature. The Persians were not an isolationist um, society like the Egyptians were. The Persians allowed for outsiders to come to and settle in their cities as long as they uh, took an oath to be, you know, supportive of the city. They paid their taxes. Uh, they were you know, they, they didn't care where you came from. And so many times these cities um, became very, uh, they, they grew very large, very wealthy. And as such, we see the size of the walls and the, the gates and the defenses getting larger and larger. And we see the, uh, um, we see the size of their the groups and cultures getting larger and larger. The cities themselves growing uh, as large as, you know, a few hundred thousand. Sometimes uh, there's one suggestion that Babylon was more than a million people, um, which in the ancient world, that would have been made it the largest city in the world. Now, these gates were also important because they made money for the city. Um, it was a way to tax those coming and going to protect, but also to tax. So to enter the city to do business, you had to pay a small tax every time you went through the gate. Uh, and they used that to support the city, to support the government, to support the defenses, to build the walls. Um, uh, and so these, uh, the, the workings of the city are a reflection of what we see in the architecture and construction. Now within the city, there would have been these, the walls and gates and this is known as the Lion Gate. Lion Gates were quite popular and common. Um, lions were, like the bulls, were in, uh, images of the strength and authority of the king. Uh, lions being the kind of the top of the food chain. Uh, never domesticated. And by the time of the Assyrians, the lions were uh, fewer and fewer. But it was a symbol. Okay, And so... As you walked through the city, as you walked through the gates from section to section, you would see these lion forms on the gates. And it would remind you that while you might, within your area of the city, you might have some autonomy. You might, you know, kind of day to day rule your, yourself or there might be a, a precinct, uh, you know, uh, all, uh, ruler, a precinct, uh, mayor, basically there was the overarching uh, government at the center of the city. So the palaces were always at the centers of the city and the city would spread out radially from there and the walls spread out radially, radially from there. And there would be gates in the walls in the four directions. And, and so people could pass from one quarter to another through these gates. Now, the divisions were important because not all of the people that lived in these cities got got along very well. Um, they had they they came from different backgrounds. Many spoke different languages, had different belief systems, lived and 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 uh, behaved differently. And so, as such, the walls provided a level of uh, safety and a level of division. So they they were all t lived together, but they didn't necessarily all agree. This is the stele of Hammurabi. It is a, it's a cultural object, but it's also a historical object. It's very important. Um, in your Western history class, you probably learned about Hammurabi's code, the first law code. 
Um, it's objects like this that not only give, tell us about the code, because the code is actually written on the bottom half, bottom three quarters of the steely, but where the code comes from and its importance. <clears throat> the image at the top, Hammurabi, who was the king, is the standing figure on the left, and he's receiving the code from the god. Now, that's important because the image is designed to give validity and authority to the code that's on the bottom. So this is basically propaganda. It's what, what this object is saying is that Hammurabi and his code come from the gods, and hence, and so they should be given, um, given the same authority of the gods. Now, Hammurabi's code was important because it changed society, and it, and it had an important effect on culture. Objects like this were, like I said, they were symbolic, but they were also cultural. They were also, uh, there was an aesthetic at work, um, and they were used symbolically to put throughout, placed throughout the cities, not just uh, one city, but all the cities ruled over by the king as a sign of that king's authority. The code itself uh, was unique because it was the first codified system of laws. And it, it didn't just have the laws, you know, what you should or shouldn't do, but it also in many cases had the punishment. It set forth, if you do this, then this is what should happen to you. And that made the system of laws more consistent, but it also made it easier to implement and the code itself could be used as a deterrent. So you'd know, okay, if I do this, then this is what's going to happen to me. And I sh so I don't want that to happen to me. Like, uh, you know, I don't want my, my stuff to be taken from me, or I don't want me to be physically harmed or even killed. So I'm not going to do these things because the law says this is what I should or shouldn't do. Prior to Hammurabi, all decisions of law had to be made individually, and they weren't always uniformly imposed. Now, art for propaganda has always been an important part of culture, but the Mesopotamians, as they developed, and many most cultures in the ancient world, the Egyptians did the same thing or similar things, the Greeks, the Romans, the Aegeans, every ancient culture, even today, we, we still see a propaganda message in our art. Um, but they used this to great effect. This is called a lamasu, um, like those, those lions that stood at the, at the gate entrances. This, is, this would have stood at the entrance to a palace. Um, there would have been two, one on either side. Um, and... So this, as you walked through the entrance, through the gateway into the palace, this is what you would have been uh, greeted with. Now, we know that this would have been a, an, an entrance lamassu because of the way that the, the head faces. It faces out. Um, it is a hybrid figure, the head of a man, the body a uh, lamassu could either be the body of a lion or a bull, in this case a lion, because it has the padded feet and not the hoofed feet, uh, and then the wings of an eagle. So, um, the, and this is a symbolic figure that's actually supposed to represent the king himself. So that's the king's head on this hybrid animal form. It's, these things are massive. Um, they stand 20 plus feet tall, 20 plus feet long. Um, they're, you'll notice something interesting about the figure. It has five legs. Um, and the reason for that is the, the perspective of the figure and the way that you would come into contact with it. As you approached from the front, you would see the front two legs as if the the the, uh, the figure were standing facing you. As you walked through from the side, you would see the four legs view, viewed from the side. Um, it's only at this angle 
which wasn't as common of perspective where you would see all five legs. Now, they did that because to them, the practical nature of it being correct, they thought it would look odd or distorted from the front or the side if it only had the four legs. Now, that's not intended to be a, a realistic portrait of the king. These images at this time were idealized. They were uh, all pretty much the same, wearing the ceremonial beards and wigs, the ceremonial headdress, the large enlarged eyes. They believed that the eyes, you know, again, those cliches that we're used to, the eyes are the windows to the soul. They believed that to see the truth in another individual, you had to look into their eyes and you could actually see into their souls and that the gods could see into your souls through your eyes. And so when you, you know, that's where all of our cliches about look somebody in the eye because you're going to see the truth comes from, comes from these figures and these people. Now this is a shedu, this is a variation of a lamasu. Um, this would have been placed in relief on the surface of a wall throughout the palace. The, you can tell the differences. Uh, the head is turned, head of the, turned to face out, so that it would have been inset into the wall. This is also uh, has the body of a bull because of the hoofed feet, but the same basic premise. It's supposed to show off the authority and the and the power of the king. Now. As the Persian culture became the Persian Empire, um, successive kings were, had, were so successful, and over centuries actually, um, and their, the society developed to be incredibly wealthy, incredibly large, and we see some uh, really amazing, amazing structures. This is Persepolis. Uh, it's, Persepolis is a Greek word. It's, it's not exactly what they called the city. Um, it's what the Greeks called the city because it's a Greek word and literally translates to Persa, which is what the Greeks called Persia, and Polis, city. So it's the city of Persia. It was actually heavily influenced in design by the Greeks. Um, lots of use of columns, colonnades, uh, open courtyard areas. There were seven palaces. This was a show showpiece and show place for the king. This entire city was designed and built for the king to greet foreign visitors uh, and to show off his wealth and power. Also, it was an abil the ability, gave the Persians the ability to control the message to foreigners. Foreigners um, wouldn't, the, the king wouldn't visit, greet foreigners in Babylon, his capital, um, because he wanted to control the message that they would then return back to their king with. If all they ever saw were the young and beautiful and strong and powerful and wealthy, if all they ever saw was Persepolis, then they would return with this with stories of the amazing glory of Persian culture. If they had visited Babylon, they would see the palaces at Babylon and the, and the high points, but they would also see the lower parts of, of Persian society because Babylon was a, a, a more typical city. Um, but you'd only see the glory at, at Persepolis. Now, um, Persepolis also was... Uh, a mixture of cultures, lots of influences. There's the use of columns, which is really more Aegean and Greek. There's uh, some different style architecture, uh, some influence uh, for, with the, the hybrid figures of perhaps the, uh, the Egyptians. Um, but it was a grand, grand city. Um, it was, and it was all about that message that Persia is this wealthy and powerful um, empire. These are reconstructions of what the temples and palaces at Persepolis we think they looked like. 
Um, it, it's out in the middle of the desert. There's, you know, so there's an oasis. It's really like an oasis in the middle of the desert. Um, and everyone who visited, because by the time of Persepolis, this is, you know, the, the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians, the, there are many, many cultures vying for control of the region. Um, and everyone who visited Persepolis wrote about it and wrote about its amazing quality. Today, it is, of course, in ruin. Persepolis was destroyed um, when Alexander took over the Persian Empire. Now, this is the palace at Shapur, and this is a more typical, what a more typical palace, uh, Persian palace would have looked like. Scale is important, obviously. They want to overwhelm the viewer overwhelm the individual with the just sheer size of these structures. And that's quite common in the ancient world, that size and scale are what's, you know, favored the most. We see the use of arches. We see the use of attached columns called pilasters. We see the use of a combination of construction of brick and stone. Um, ob these... Uh, these structures reflect the influence of a variety of cultures because Persia was a truly cosmopolitan culture. It was not um, just solely Mesopotamian. It, it borrowed influences from all of the cultures that surrounded it. Now, Babylon no longer exists. It was completely destroyed. But some of the objects that were carted off from Babylon still do exist. This is the Ishtar Gate. This is one of 11 gates from, and a section of wall from within the city. Um, and you can see how, how far Persia has come. This is a gate from within the city, and this would have been uh, taking the place of that Lion Gate. But there are still the decorative forms uh, of the, in relief. Um, what's amazing about this is the construction. These are bricks that have been glazed with that blue glaze that's made using lapis, which was the most expensive material in the ancient world. Lapis lazuli it was ground up to make that blue pigment. And it's so to have the walls and the gates completely covered in that is just an sign of extravagant wealth. Um, it would have... Uh, there's just it's hard to under understate how um, how expensive it would have been to create objects like this. Um, by our standards, it would be like covering the roads and walls of our cities with gold. The uh, the imagery is a reflection of Mesopotamian style. It's geometric. It's repetitive. It's patterned. Um, it's hybrid figures. It's these stretched and elongated figures. Um, but figures that you can still recognize, camels and horses, and, and the, the very typical figures um, that you might expect. Now, we have a few, especially from later Persia, we have a few uh, smaller decorative objects, like the, this uh, goblet. This is a, a, an individual cup carved in silver. Um, the handle is of this uh, kind of almost oriental decorative lion. Um, this shows the level of their, their uh, you know, metalworking and silversmithing. Um, this is cast and then all the small fine details carved. And you can tell that this object's been well worn and used. The handle that it shows the sign of use from repetitive you know, picking up and wearing. Um, and what's interesting about these objects is that they show that uh, the same level of care and attention to detail taken for the decorative for the, the you know the things to be used within the home it's not just applying the the decoration and their attention to those details to the big grand things it's also the small things that matter um, they wanted that same level of attention to all the objects in their lives now um Life was lived communally for these people. They tended to live in large family groups, uh, and they ate together communally, uh, still do today. 
Um, and they had very strict rules of etiquette and protocol about you know, how, who, who, you, who, who, who you share with and how you share. Um, to have individual cups was rare. Uh, cups were usually shared the same way that food would be shared. Um, and a cup would be passed around. Uh, and so as such, the, it wasn't that they had a large uh, gathering of cups. There, there would, really would have been one cup that was passed communally and then refilled. And so you know, each individual of these goblets or chalices would have been very, very special. And, that's, and so the imagery on the outside uh, connects to the family, connects to the stories, connects to the lives of the people. Now, this probably is a cup that would have been used uh, by a very, very wealthy individual, perhaps a, a member of the nobility, because it's gold, because the, the level of the carving and the casting uh, is very, very high level. And um, as such, it's, it's not probably not something that would have been the everyday. Uh, for the everyday individual, th these cups would have been made from either ceramic or uh, perhaps perhaps uh, cast bronze. Now, as we move out of Mesopotamia, what we're going to see is the influence of Mesopotamia on the cultures around it. We're going to see the differences between them and their neighbors. Um, but we're also going to see some similarities in the development, developing language developing the use of art to support the message of the people um, and the influence of the people on others and, and on themselves and to record their own history. So uh, look for that in subsequent lectures to come.